Everyone, welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I'm going to turn it over to our Vice Chair for Education, Dr. Sandrine Van Schaik, to introduce our speaker for today. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm incredibly excited about our speaker and the topic. Um, Dr. Boyd uh, almost doesn't need an introduction for uh, most people um, here. She uh, is a former UCSF uh, resident. Uh, a pediatrician, public health advocate, and scholar. She writes and teaches on the relationships between structural racism and equity in health, and does so very eloquently. Um, and it is actually her writing on the topic that she's presenting uh, on today that made me reach out to her. She came and gave Rand's rounds a little bit more than a year ago, I think, uh, maybe longer even, like when we just got into the uh, pandemic. Um, uh, very, very good talk that, uh, as a matter of fact, has gotten a thousand YouTube views on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, and uh, when I read her work on, um, on, on the current situation with vaccinations, uh, I thought we should really hear her speak. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Boyd, she works clinically and has a scholarly focus on the uh, child and public health impacts of harmful pol policing practices and policies. She partners with San Diego 211, um, working with navigators to address the social needs of San Diegans impacted by chronic illness and poverty. She's the director of equity and justice for the California Children's Trust, an initiative to advance mental health access for children and youth across California. In partnership with the Kaiser Family Foundation, Black Coalition Against COVID and Unidas US, she co-developed the conversation between us about us a national campaign to bring credible information about the COVID vaccines directly to Black, Latinx, and Spanish-speaking communities. And I already mentioned that uh, she was a UCSF resident. Uh, before that, she, created, she graduated cum laude with a BA in Africana Studies and Health from the University of Notre Dame. She earned her MD at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine then come, came to us for residency and subsequently graduated from the Commonwealth Fund Morgan Minority Health Policy Fellowship at Harvard University School of Public Health and earned an MPH for that. Um, teaching about and addressing racial health inequities is a core of her scholarly work. And um, her work to address COVID vaccine equity actually began even before the vaccines um, received emergency use authorization and continues um, to take place. And, uh, that's what she will be speaking on today, and I will, without further ado, hand it over to Dr. Boyd. Thank you so much, Sandrine. Hey, y'all. Thank you again for having me back. Let me just share my screen really quickly. Okay. So um, we are gonna be talking about vaccine equity predominantly today, but we're also gonna talk about what vaccine equity has taught us about racism and the distribution of inequity across the country and how that relates to child health generally, but specifically also during the pandemic. So I titled this a pandemic of the unequal because I want us to challenge through what we're gonna talk through today, the notion that we're having a pandemic of the unvaccinated. We heard that kind of rhetoric and language come out of the federal administration during the most recent surge of COVID when vaccination rates in the US lagged behind other wealthy nation peers. And so there was this kind of blaming of this population who was unvaccinated and this treatment of that group as if it was like a monolithic group. And so we're gonna talk through who still remains unvaccinated and what are some of the efforts that we're undertaking to get our nation vaccinated. I don't have any disclosures, so let's start. So I love using these figures from the New York Times. They capture every day the latest kind of COVID data in maps like this. And so this is looking at current spots in the US where there's COVID outbreaks. And areas on the map that are darker and red in color are areas where outbreaks are the greatest. And so we can see that right now, the predominance of um, COVID is across the Pacific West. But if we look back at the most recent Delta surge, which is the time 
um, throughout the pandemic, when we actually saw the highest rates of COVID for children and adults, we saw a very different distribution of disease. So this is again, looking at the New York Times data, but instead we're looking back in September when we were at the peak of that Delta surge. And instead of just a predominance in that kind of Northwest region, we see a predominance in the Southeast. We saw similar predominance in the Southeast for COVID hospitalizations back at the peak of the Delta wave. And we also saw during that time that the Southeast was an area that was disproportionately less likely to be vaccinated. If we compare that to now, so that last image was of us back in September at the peak of the Delta wave. And this is an image from New York Times, it was updated as of yesterday. And you can see that the lighter areas are areas where vaccine coverage is the least for folks who are fully vaccinated in the country. And that continues to be concentrated in the US Southeast. So now we're gonna ask, what is it about the US Southeast that makes both COVID rates the highest during COVID surges when they're highest generally across the nation? and what similarly makes or might contribute to vaccination rates in that same area being lower, because we know those two things are related. So first we have to ask, well, who lives there? This is data from Kaiser Family Foundation, and it shows that where there's darker areas on the map where most black folks live in this country. And so as the map illustrates, more than 50% of black African-Americans in this country live in the Southeast. We also see that if we look particularly in uh, the Southwest, that that's where most Latinx populations live in this country. This is data taken from the CDC uh, vaccine tracker. Now there's a fair amount of data missingness in this vaccine tracker. There's a number of states who haven't reported their data based on race and ethnicity, but from the data the CD has, CDC has as of yesterday, we see that Black and Latinx populations continue to lag a bit behind other racial and ethnic groups when it comes to vaccination, particularly when it comes to being fully vaccinated. Um, only 34% of the states for which are reporting data to the CDC have uh, their Black populations fully vaccinated, for example. If we then look at that same CDC data by age, we also see that young folks that we care for have the lowest vaccination rates of any uh, age demographic in the country. And this is in part because kids uh, age 12 and up were only authorized to receive a COVID vaccine as recently as May, because the early rollout focused on adults who had the predominance of severe illness. But since May, we still haven't seen a rapid rise in uh, vaccination for 12 to 17 year olds. Currently only about 48% of less than 50% of 12 to 17 year olds are fully vaccinated. Um, and just over 57% uh, have received at least one dose at this point. And if you look at the daily um, additional vaccinations, like how many additional folks in that age group are getting vaccinated, it's only 1.5% of that population each day, and that number is decreasing. So we have really plateaued in a way for vaccinations for folks age 12 to 17, which is concerning because we know that just this past Tuesday, it was um, the CDC followed the FDA and ACIP's recommendations that uh, kids age five to 11 get vaccinated. And so for these caregivers who have elected not to vaccinate their 12 to 17 year olds, um, which is, uh, just over or just under a half of folks who are eligible, we're concerned that if they also have a five to 11 year old, they may make the same choice. And we'll talk about some of the factors that shape those choices. So we don't have much data on kids by race and ethnicity, but this is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation back in September, again, when we were at the peak of the Delta surge. And they looked at particular states who did report um, data disaggregated by age and race. And what we saw is that for folks who are under age 18 and were at that point authorized to receive a COVID vaccine, which is kids 12 to 18, um, black kids in particular across the states for which there were data had the lowest COVID vaccination rates, which again reflects the data that we've seen in adults basically since the COVID vaccines were initially authorized for adults back in December of 2020. And so again, I call us to think about what term would we use to describe these differences? So we could use a term like health disparities, which describes population level differences in a health outcome, 
or a term like health inequities, which describes those population level differences that are preventable. And because they're preventable, they're unjust. So last time I gave grand rounds, I think it was in June of last year, I call this to the same slide. And I want us to remember again, to be very clear in the language we use, because what we're witnessing right now with the rollout of the COVID vaccines and with the unequal distribution of COVID morbidity and mortality are truly inequities. They are completely preventable and that makes them unjust. And so we're gonna to refer to them as inequities throughout this presentation. So where do inequities come from? Inequities arise when certain groups are made vulnerable. And I put that in red and in bold to always remind us that no racial or ethnic group is innately or genetically more vulnerable to COVID-19 than any other. Folks are made vulnerable. And usually that happens through the inequitable distribution of protections to keep folks from getting sick, as we're watching happen in real time right now with the COVID vaccines, and the inequitable distribution of supports to help treat sickness when it arrives. And we're gonna talk about critical sports that are missing for uh, communities who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. One of those supports is insurance access. So this is data from Kaiser Family Foundation from January of this year that looked at where folks live in the country if you are in the coverage gap. And what they found is that by region, 97% of adults in the US who live in the coverage gap live in the US South. So what's the coverage gap? The coverage gap means you as an individual adult earn too much to qualify for state-sponsored insurance like in California and Medi-Cal, but you also earn too low to qualify for the uh, tax subsidies to enter the marketplace to buy your own insurance. And so those folks remain basically uncovered. They're between the income level that would allow them to be covered by a state subsidized insurance platform. And as you can see from the figure on the left here, many of those states are states that did not expand Medicaid. And so when we think about how insurance access might shape vaccine uptake, we again have to turn to um, some Kaiser Family Foundation data because they've been doing really robust polling throughout the pandemic to look at where most folks actually wanna get the COVID vaccine. And it turns out, and I put a red star by those places here on the left, the top locations where people wanna get the vaccine are places that you go to if you have insurance, right? The number one place most folks wanna get their vaccine is their own doctor's office. People wanna to go to hospitals, they wanna to go to community clinics. Even wanting to go to a pharmacy means you likely want to have access to insurance to help pay for the other medications you might receive at that pharmacy. But again, if you don't have insurance, you both don't have reliable access to these settings, but you also don't have a familiarity with what it takes to actually access care in those settings. What route would you drive? Where would you park? Who would you ask questions to if you needed to know how to get scheduled? If you don't have insurance and you haven't built in those pathways for yourself, you're much less likely to start now for a vaccine. If we turn to the right, we also see that people want to turn to places you need insurance to access just to get simple information about the vaccines. We know right now we're in a period of massive disinformation about the COVID vaccines. And so it's really critical that people have a trusted source to turn to. Most people in our benefit wanna to go to their own child's pediatrician to ask questions about the vaccine. But again, if parents aren't vaccinated, even if that child is covered, which most kids in the country are covered either through Medi-Cal or CHIP or private insurance, um, if the parents aren't covered, evidence has shown that it shapes how their children also utilize healthcare. Uh, similarly, adults wanna go to their own doctor and some even want their own insurance company. Um, three quarters of people shockingly want their own insurance company to share that information with them. And so again, when insurance access isn't evenly distributed by region and racial groups aren't evenly distributed by region, we know that folks of color are more likely to be uninsured as a result of those political processes, like the lack of expansion of Medicaid across much of the US South, that then shapes how folks would access information about the vaccine and the COVID vaccines themselves. I wanna go back to this figure that we covered the first time I presented because I think it's a helpful way to think through how we can reframe how we talk about risk for COVID. So even now, 18 months into this pandemic and seeing the unequal burden that it has taken on communities of color, we continue to say that people who are most at risk for COVID are folks who have chronic underlying illness, folks who are elderly, or folks who live in poverty. 
And when we frame it in that way as a field, we overlook and turn kind of a blind eye to the ways that residential segregation has shaped the racial distribution of heart disease in this country, or the ways that chronic discrimination has shaped who have diseases like hypertension and who does not, or how environmental racism has determined who breathes in clean air and who breathes in toxins, and thus shapes the racial distribution of chronic lung disease or COPD, or how the racial wealth gap has profoundly concentrated poverty within communities of color or how toxic stress and exposures that separate children in that zero to five period from their caregiver can raise an individual's allostatic load or increase the wear and tear on their organ systems such that their cells are weathered, which means their cellular age could be advanced of their chronological age and they could suffer complications from COVID at much younger ages than expected. This we could see um, occurring when we looked at rates of COVID hospitalization and multi-inflammatory syndrome in children that had higher prevalence rates in among children of color, particularly Black and Latinx kids. These are all examples of how structural racism has shaped the racial distribution of who has COVID and who doesn't. Or in the words of Kamara Jones, who is just an incredible pediatric leader for all of us, it shows how inherited disadvantage, not just inherited disease, has shaped who does well and who does not do well in the middle of a pandemic. Taken together, this figure is meant to illustrate how the physical, but also the structural, the legal, the policy environment in which we're all growing, learning, and playing shapes not only our health, but the health of our kids and our kids' kids. And so when we talk about the risk of COVID at the population level, you can't simply use words like poverty or underlying illness to describe who's most at risk. Instead, we must become much more facile with talking about the legacies and current practices of racial exclusion, discrimination, disinvestment, and violence that concentrates disadvantage within communities of color, creates adversity for children of color that then follows them across their life course, and shapes population level opportunities for folks to be well, and provides the perfect conditions for folks who live in segregated communities of color to be sicker. That's why as early as August of last year, researcher Elizabeth Rickey Field said, despite COVID-19 becoming the third leading cause of death, white mortality, she projected, would be less than what black folks have experienced in this country every year pre-pandemic. So this figure is adapted from the New York Times and that dotted line shows that alarming jump in white projected mortality as a result of the pandemic. And above it, that black line illustrates the enormous chasm that still exists between white mortality because of the pandemic and black mortality at baseline in this country. And so that's why she said in 2020, white life expectancy would stay higher than black life expectancy has ever been in this country, despite us being in the middle of the most deadly pandemic we've seen in the century. Sadly, she was right. In the first half of 2020, life expectancy for all Americans fell by a year, but the greatest losses were experienced by black and Latinx populations. Non-Hispanic Black folks lost 2.7 years and uh, Hispanic populations lost 1.9 years of their lifespan in comparison to non-Hispanic White folks who lost 0.8 years. If you disaggregate the data by race and gender, we see that uh, Black men and women experienced the greatest declines with non-Hispanic Black men losing three years of their lives last year and non-Hispanic Black women losing 2.3 years, which are enormous drops in life expectancy over such short a time period. We know that those drops in life expectancy are attributable to higher mortality rates that impact children. So this is a a uh, paper that just came out last month in pediatrics that told us that more than 120,000 kids across the country lost their primary caregiver because of COVID associated death. And more than 140,000 lost a primary or secondary caregiver, which includes the other caregivers and kinship providers who live within the home, like a grandparent. The study went on to say that there were enormous racial and ethnic inequities in who experienced the loss of a caregiver because of the pandemic. As I said, compared to white children, um, indigenous kids were 4.5 times more likely to lose a parent or grandparent as a result of COVID associated death. Black children were 2.4 times more likely and Latinx children were 1.8 times more likely to lose their caregiver. 
So even as we see children weather these enormous losses, which are sources of toxic stress that raise their allostatic load and increase their risk for chronic illness as they move into adulthood, we know that those losses were not evenly distributed. And we have to acknowledge that bereavement data tells us that children of color were already more at risk to lose a caregiver because of the higher mortality rates, particularly of black and indigenous populations. This data that was summarized by uh, Dr. David Williams in his summaries on racism and health, which I highly recommend, where he notes that compared with white children, at baseline, black children are three times as likely to lose a mother by age 10, and black adults are more than twice as likely to lose their child by age 30 and a spouse by age 60. So pre-pandemic, we already had a mortality crisis within communities of color, particularly black and indigenous communities. And that crisis was only compounded by losses that we've seen during the pandemic. Losses that again, were completely preventable. And so this is data taken from the um, weekly uh, state data report from the American Academy of Pediatrics that tracks the number of COVID cases for adults and children. I highlight it here because often in the media, we've heard folks say, you know, oh, kids aren't affected by COVID. And as pediatrician folks who work, you know, in our hospitals and our ICUs, we know that that's absolutely untrue. But even when presented with the fact that the light blue bars here, which are adults, much greater than the dark blue bar, which are child cases, we have to acknowledge that every light blue bar who is a primary or secondary caregiver to a child impacts the kids too. And so we should think about the impact of COVID on kids, not simply as the burden of illness that kids bear as a result of the pandemic, um, as we can see surges every time we see the same surges for adults, but also as um, a compounding of the uh, burden of COVID among adults that also shapes who the caregivers in children's lives are. These figures illustrate the ways that racism is truly a violent process that shapes the distribution of death and disease in this country and can work to separate kids from the social networks on which they rely and in which they thrive. Ultimately, the violence of racism and the many structural inequalities that racism creates at a population level works to disappear caregivers. That's why racism is a critical root of childhood adversity. You can't talk about ACEs if you're not ready to talk about how racism works. This is a figure from researcher Wendy Ellis that illustrates that point incredibly well. What we see at the top of the tree here um, are the ACEs or adverse childhood experiences that we often screen for in, for example, the state mandated Pearl screener. We ask questions about individual experiences within single households. But what those questions often overlook are the community environment that shapes and then determines those individual experiences. And every single one of these community environments or these roots of ACEs are driven and shaped by racism. And so we have to acknowledge that racism is a devastating root of chronic undertreated disease and completely preventable premature death in the United States. Here, I think the words of ta quotes are particularly um, salient. As he says in his best-selling book, Between the World and Me, but all our phrasing, racial relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. We must never look away from this. We must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions, all land with great violence upon the body including the bodies of our children. In short, racism kills folks. And so if we're going to advance anti-racism and racial health equity, we actually have to begin as a field to challenge the national political economy. Why do I say that? I say that because in the United States, our political economy actually profits off of racial inequality. 
The term for that is called racial capitalism. What it acknowledges is that as an economy, capitalism uses the durable racial hierarchy that racism creates to allow um, a few people to accumulate most of the resources. It does that by extracting or taking resources from those with the greatest need and relocating them towards folks who don't have the greatest need. We see that show up in how our own healthcare system functions through the insurance marketplace that allows us lawfully to tier and segregate our care based on the insurance status individuals and households have. And doing that then renders certain populations more vulnerable to death and disease while making others marginally less so. And so when we think about the supports and protections that folks need, particularly during a pandemic like this, we have to acknowledge that access related barriers to the vaccine are actually remnants of that political economy resurging within our healthcare system. So this is data again from Kaiser Family Foundation back from August in this year that asked particularly black and Latinx parents about barriers to them vaccinating their kids. And things that we saw come to the surface that are particularly concerning are that people were worried they'd have to take off work to get their child vaccinated or to care for them if their child had a side effect. People worried that they couldn't get the vaccine from a place they trust. As we noted, if you don't have health insurance and you can't go to a pediatrician that you might trust, people don't want to just show up at a random site and get the vaccine from a random person. People also worried about out-of-pocket costs to get the COVID vaccine for their kids. This has come up again and again as I've spoken to the media about the barriers for folks of color getting the vaccine. As I always remind people, while everyone at this point knows the vaccines are free, it doesn't mean that actually receiving medical care is cost neutral, right? Anytime somebody shows up at our clinic doors or at our ER doors or our hospitals, they had to expend some resources to get there, right? Folks have to have gas in your tank unless you live across the street from the hospital and you're able-bodied enough to walk. You have to have a bus fare or perhaps a train ticket to actually get there. And then you have to have it for the return trip too. If you're a caregiver to multiple kids of various ages and not all those ages are authorized to receive the vaccine, you may need childcare, which costs money for most people if you don't have other um, support networks around you. And so when folks have highlighted the out-of-pocket cost to get vaccinated, it's not them saying, oh, is it free? It's them saying, wake up healthcare system. The healthcare system isn't free to access and get back from. And so to make sure people can access this free vaccine, we actually have to cover all of the hidden costs of receiving care, which is something as a system we've never been fully invested in doing. And again, the last star there is you see people are worried about difficulty traveling, again, the costs of getting their vaccine. We also saw early in August that one out of four parents of unvaccinated 12 to 17 year olds said that they would be more likely to get their kid vaccinated if their employer gave them paid time off. They also said free transportation and if their medical provider just came to them right at their work site, they would be more likely to get their kids vaccinated. This again highlights the access barriers that are critical for us vaccinating our nation's kids. Interestingly, high income parents were more likely to get information about the vaccine from their schools. We know higher income parents go to schools that are segregated and predominantly white because of the history of residential segregation shaping school segregation. And so it means a lot that high income parents and predominantly white parents have access to vaccine information that communities of color who go to segregated school districts do not have access to. Um, that lack of encouragement to get vaccinated by the school and that lack of access to information means communities of color are at a disadvantage when it comes to understanding the benefits and the risks of vaccination so that they can make the choice for their kids. I included this slide because I found it fascinating that back in August, um, they looked at parents of vaccinated kids, 12 to 17, I put a star there. So when you talk to the parents of vaccinated kids about what their kid is worried about, even kids who had already got the vaccine, more than a third, were worried about side effects. 
That's a reflection to me of how poor a job we've done in explaining how the vaccines work, even to people who have selected or elected to get vaccinated. Because every person who does get vaccinated could become a sentinel of credible information for their networks and those around them. But if we're not doing a good job explaining even to those who are vaccinated what they just went through and what they can expect and what the benefits were of what they went through, they're unable to then advocate to others, which puts us as a system at a disadvantage when we are trying to take on this Herculean effort to vaccinate every single person in the country eventually. And so again, back in August, when we looked at parents' uh, vaccination intentions, we saw that the parents who were the least likely to be vaccinated, which uh, we worried would be a reflection of the parents who were less likely to vaccinate their kids, were parents who are particularly young, those who are 18 to 39, parents who were low income, who had a household income less than $40,000, parents who were Black, and parents who were Republican. So this is data from August. If we now look at the most recent data that came out just last week, we see that vaccine uptake has shifted enormously. So first I'm gonna call our attention to the dark blue bars. These are the folks who when Kaiser Family Foundation does their you know, representative poll of our population, they say they've already gotten at least one dose. And what we can see is that when you look, and I put a blue bar around black adults, when you look at black adults and white adults, which is two down from uh, black adults, you see that more than 70% of black folks and white folks, and this now is true for all racial groups, have received at least one dose of vaccine. This is true when you poll people. The CDC data, because it has a lot of missingness, um, doesn't capture the same data that you can capture when you take a representative population poll. Um, I highlight that because an enormous amount of work has been done. And I'll talk at the very end briefly about the campaign I've been a part of, but there has been so much work on behalf of the black community to get our folks vaccinated and it has worked. Now only 9%, which is the green bar on the far right of black folks have said they definitely will not get vaccinated, which is the lowest percentage of any demographic group here other than Democrats um, and folks who are age 65 and older. So this is an enormous victory. It is to say that it works when you try to focus specifically on the access barriers that communities of color are facing. But now let's turn to these red stars at the bottom of the figure. What we're now seeing is that the populations who are least likely to get vaccinated or those who when polled say they will definitely not get vaccinated are predominantly white evangelical Christians Republicans, and folks who live in rural America. This is a shift in what we saw initially with the COVID vaccine rollout. Um, and we're gonna talk just a little bit about that. And I hope folks have questions at the end that we can even maybe have a discussion about what's going on. So there's a paper that just came out last month um, from Harvard School of Public Health. It's a working paper, which means it has not yet been peer reviewed, but they've been doing amazing work to just release all of their papers um, open source online, which I really appreciate. And they look specifically at what's going on with political affiliation and COVID morbidity and mortality. And what they found is that folks who reside in counties that both have the highest poverty level and the highest, what they call political lean or percentage of folks who um, on their voting roll report themselves as Republicans were nearly six times more likely to die from COVID compared to those who resided in areas that had the lowest poverty level and the highest political lean towards Democratic. So areas with lots of resources and with Democrats, interestingly, have lower mortality rates from COVID. They went on to point out that people who reside in counties with the highest percentage of people of color and highest political lean towards Republicans had also a very high mortality rate, not as high as people who are low income and Republican, which is six times more likely to die, but they were five times more likely to die than folks who lived in counties that had the lowest percentage of people of color and the highest political lean towards Democrats. I wanna just recall our mind to the beginning of our presentation today when we talked about um, insurance access by region and where folks of color live and how 
failing to expand Medicaid, which many Republican-led states across the Southeast have done, then shapes people's um, access behaviors when it relates, or their healthcare utilization behaviors when it relates to the COVID vaccines. This is a great illustration of just how stark or how important those political decisions are. Um, and it becomes an illustration of what structural racism looks like. And so the author summarized, um, led by first author Nancy Krieger, they summarized that the county level political lean is actually a crucial bar variable that we have to now monitor if we wanna understand COVID cases and mortality alongside the socio-demographic and socioeconomic data we are long used to capturing. And so if we're going to respond at scale to racism as a public health crisis, we have to challenge the political economy of racism and white supremacy. And in my opinion, I think that challenge is most powerfully articulated through the language of abolition. So this is a figure I showed in my last presentation, but we're gonna talk about it in a bit of a different way this time. So often this baseball game picture is used to describe the difference between equality and equity. And we're now in this paradigm of equity being the goal of many of our healthcare interventions. In the first picture on the left here for equality, you see that if folks are of varying heights and you offer them the same size box, still not everyone can see the baseball game. And then the equitable picture, which is supposed to be better, shows that if you give more boxes to the shortest person, that they then can access and see the baseball game. The idea is that equitable interventions can distribute resources according to need, and that, that is superior to equal interventions that don't take into account uh, disparate levels of need. But here I want to quote Angela Davis, famed scholar and abolitionist, because I think this image become a reflection of how difficult it is for us to envision a social order or progress in society that doesn't rely upon fences, which often are our systems that are designed to separate us and perpetuate inequality, right? Even in the equity picture, the fence is still there. And yet equity has become the cornerstone of so many of our healthcare interventions. And so if we're talking about abolishing racism, neither of these pictures are sufficient. Instead, we have to get into the business of eliminating fences. And to do that, we first actually have to reorient our perspective in the image. And so this is um, a picture by artist Arya Galili taken from um, an article in Academic Psychiatry by Nicholas Barcelo and colleagues at UCLA. And I really appreciate it because it captures visually what critical race theory asks us to do, which is to center at the margins. Or if you want to understand how to address inequity, to um, come to understand the problem from the perspective of those most affected. And so if we do that, and we're on the other side of the fence, right? The first thing you notice is we can't even see the baseball game. As viewers, we're not this eye above what's happening here where we can see both sides. Instead, we've centered ourselves on what it's like to be on the other side of that fence. And when you do that, again, you can't see the benefits that are just beyond your reach. This is akin to folks not asking for services that we know they might benefit for from, right? Like, why didn't you go get that referral? Why didn't you show up to that follow-up visit? Why didn't you think to apply for this program your kid qualifies for? Literally, if you are the most marginalized, those things may be beyond your reach. Information about those things or your ability to access those things may be literally beyond your reach as if they don't even exist, right? And then the other thing that he did a great job of, or this artist did a great job of in this image, is showing that no one is just short. So in the first picture, we often don't question the fact that people are of varying heights, which metaphorically could mean that people are kind of innately or maybe even genetically different. And that's what makes their needs for boxes different. Instead, as we acknowledged early in this presentation, people aren't innately or genetically different. The difference between racial groups is that certain folks are made to experience life on their knees. This is a guy here who um, is shackled behind his back because he's ensnared in the criminal justice system. And other folks are from communities that have been chronically divested in. That's the person here standing in the hole. 
And in the setting of us holding those groups back, we then artificially advantage other groups by giving them the only box in the scenario. That is a better depiction of what's actually happening when we're talking about inequitable needs. As um, Dr. Barcelo says, we have to confront the ways inequality is constructed and perpetuated. And resituating even just our frame in images like this helps us to acknowledge that. And Nico actually went to UCSF. He was a med student there. Um, and so if we think about, for example, the ways that inequality is perpetuated and constructed, we have to acknowledge all the families who have said, well, if we had paid sick leave, I'd be more likely to get my child vaccinated. Well, we know, and this is data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, that um, Latinx and black uh, folks are less likely to have access to paid sick leave within their jobs. And that's that model one you see here on the left. The other two figures, model two and three, account for controlling for the different employment sectors that folks work in. But we know that where folks work in the employment sectors that include people of various racial and ethnic groups are also a reflection of our nation's history of structural racism. And so again, this is just highlighting and reminding us that paid time off really matters when it comes to vaccinating kids. So now let's think just for briefly at the end of our presentation today before we open up for questions, what it means now to try to vaccinate five to 11 year olds. So first, there's almost 50 million kids under the age of 12 in the US, which is triple the number of folks who are age 12 to 15. So we just went through a period where in May, folks 12 and up were authorized to receive one of the COVID vaccines. But now we have the challenge of vaccinating many more children, 28 million of whom are five to 11. And if you look at kids who are under 12, more than half are kids of color and the vast majority are black or Latinx. And so when we talk about inequities in vaccine access and uptake, we have to acknowledge that five to 11 year olds may be one of our greatest challenges as a nation in overcoming those inequities. And so the first point is, when we think about our nation's unvaccinated, they're not this monolithic group of anti-vaxxers. Instead, we have really clear evidence throughout the vaccine rollout and the pandemic that they reflect populations who our healthcare system has chronically underserved and those populations' children. And we have to acknowledge that now we've seen this demographic, this demographic shift in who remains unvaccinated, particularly among Republicans, folks who live in rural America and white evangelical Christians. And so that then reflects people who have been advantaged by historically inequitable distribution pathways of public services, including healthcare services. And those groups and their kids are now denying those services. When those services don't remain exclusionary because the vaccine's free and available to everybody, and when they're not provided on their own terms, when people are mandated to get the vaccine instead of being able to select it on their own. This isn't the first time something like that has happened. I wanted to highlight this because I find it such a stark example of our nation's history of white supremacy and structural racism. And it's an example that almost defies logic that folks would deny a service that's freely available to them simply because other folks have access to it and they can't determine um, the terms on which folks receive that service. So I wanna remind us what happened in Prince Edward County, Virginia, back after Brown v. Board. So Brown v. Board desegregated US public schools. It was the Supreme Court decision that desegregated US public schools in 1954. After 1954, many counties across the nation, uh, particularly those in the US South, defied the order. They didn't desegregate. So there was Brown v. Board 1, which said desegregate, and Brown v. Board 2, a follow-up decision that said you have to desegregate with all deliberate speed. After Brown v. Board 2 came out um, in 1959, what Prince Edward County, Virginia did was different than any other county in the country. They said, we would rather shut down 
all public schools than integrate. And so when Brown v. Board 2 set a deadline by 1959, the school became the only school district in the country to say, we're not gonna desegregate and close public schools rather than desegregate. As this author notes, the segregationist rhetoric emanating from the county at that time was grounded in arguments about privatization, which we see today in remnants of arguments about school vouchers for private schools, in local self-determination, taxpayers' rights, which we see today in arguments about freedom and rights as it comes to selecting the COVID vaccines. And as they note, arguments like these would come to dominate conservative rhetoric nationwide. I point this out because I think we don't have enough of, um, we don't have a strong enough analysis of how white supremacy shapes acceptance and utilization of public services in the country, even when it harms white populations too. And so in this scenario, actually, Prince Edward County gave white students public sponsored vouchers to go to private schools while they closed public schools. And for the five years from 1959 to 1964, black kids who lived in Prince Edward County had no education. It was simply lost years. Many parents, as um, Carol Anderson notes in her book, White Rage, which I highly recommend, parents would send their kids north to go to school with other family members. So kids were gone from their parents for years, just trying to get an education. Or they would have these basement schools where basically they were like daycares where people would be watched and they would try to do some education, but it was not with you know, formally trained teachers. This is a horrific example, but it's one that we have to remember when we watch what's happening now with vaccine uptake. And so there's two takeaways. If we're gonna vaccinate a nation in the setting of growing racial inequality in this country, we have to get rid of the real and perceived barriers to access to actually make vaccine a possibility for families. For us, a main principle of doing that is family vaccination. And we'll talk about what that means. But first I'll go over why it's so important kind of clinically. So this was also published just last month in JAMA where they looked at over 800,000 families and they found an inverse dose response relationship between the number of family members who were immune to COVID because of vaccination and basically the incidence of COVID infection in a household member. And they were able to, to reduce the incidence of COVID infection by as much as 97%. Um, as the numbers of household members with vaccination increased. So here's the figure. If you start at A, which is on the top left, and you move to B, which is the right, and then C, which is the bottom left, and then D, which is the right, you see every time an additional family member gets vaccinated, the curve goes down and further to zero, which reflects um, the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 in those households. So vaccinating not just individuals, but households and families is really critical to community level protection. And so what that means is we need policies that support family vaccination. And so what we've been advocating for is a no wrong door approach. So anyone who shows up at a visit for a child also gets offered a COVID vaccine if they are a caregiver or a sibling of that person. And that everyone gets vaccinated together, whether they show up at the ER or they show up for a regularly scheduled well child check or they show up um, and, be, and they're admitted to the hospital. We also think community-based sites that have family-friendly hours for workers, for caregivers who work evenings or um, multiple day shifts are really important to make sure it's a possibility for folks and obviously making sure it's cost neutral, which is very different than just making the vaccine free. Folks need open access to credible information about the COVID vaccines. This is a plug for my own project in partnership with Kaiser Family Foundation and Black Coalition Against COVID and Unidos US. Um, our website is www.betweenusaboutus.org. And we have folks from all across the country, including some of my lovely colleagues from, um, uh, Children's Oakland, who helped us create uh, this website that has shared um, more than 150 videos about the COVID vaccines with our communities of color. We now have more than 100 million views. And so for us, uh, more than like a stamp of approval, it more illustrates how hungry people are for any information about the COVID vaccines that they would watch 
so many videos about them. If folks are looking to share these resources, we encourage that. It's completely free on the website. Uh, we have toolkits. If you're looking for how to share them on your social media, you can download the videos. You can share them on your own. You don't need any permission. They're completely free. Just steal them and use them everywhere. But we also have to say that, you know, all of the science that is really important is often behind the paywall. Even for us sometimes, I can't read articles because they're behind paywalls. And so we have to get rid of that, right? Particularly for all of the data around COVID-19, but one could argue for all health conditions. Any of us have media platforms now, and we should share credible information about the COVID vaccines, even if it's just retweeting or sharing information from other credible sources like the CDC or a campaign like ours. And we're also advocating to have um, clinicians reach out to patients individually. So for kids, it's really important that um, their parents hear from their pediatrician or provider that the COVID vaccine is good for them to get in the setting of their healthcare conditions and the rest of their health history. And these are the places where they can get it or get more information about it. And so in general, universal care would go a long way, eliminating health insurance would go a long way and making care more equitable during the pandemic as would universal child care so folks can seek care, paid sick leave, which we discussed, free access to credible information, making our social safety net more robust, and obviously redistributing wealth across racial and ethnic groups. But we also have to say that if we're gonna vaccinate a nation in the setting of almost completely unchecked supremacy, we have to develop local and national processes to name and address the ways that white supremacy shapes healthcare utilization and contributes to poor health outcomes for white folks too. And so that means we have to develop processes to confront anti-science, both in rhetoric and in practice and challenge structural racism so that we can have a more just society so that we don't see such disproportionate morbidity and mortality among all of our populations, right? Like even though communities of color certainly and black folks in particular lost so much of their life expectancy, everyone who lives in the US lost on average a year last year because it's so unequal here. And obviously that's preventable. And so we have to get after addressing it. So I'm gonna stop here and open it for um, discussion and questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd, for just uh, such a thought provoking and, and important uh, talk. I, I'm really, um, can't say enough of how, how important this is and how impressed I am with how you um, put it all together for us and really point out uh, where the work needs to be uh, done. Um, uh, if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I see one, not a question, but a comment from uh, Dr. Lee Atkinson McAvoy. Uh, thank you for this very thought provoking presentation which shines a bright spotlight on our systemic racism and how inadequately we address them when trying to improve. Care. Um, Thanks, Lee. And I, I, I know from experience um, that I have to uh, give it just a couple minutes for people to um, to put uh, things in the Q and A. Um, but in the while we're waiting for that, um, I, I'll. I'll say like I really appreciated you sharing that um, the the website um, that you've created with a group uh, for and I can't actually wait uh, to check it out. I haven't done it yet. Um, do you have you said you had a hundred million views? Do you have any sense like are there groups that you reach with it and are there groups that you feel like we still don't get that group? Is there a way to track that? Do you have information? Yes, yeah, so those 100 million views are not random. Um, we do a fair amount of fundraising so that we uh, can actually place. So the internet is a very tricky place and algorithms shape what all of us see. And so we actually pay to make sure that it shows up on people's feeds if you search for information about COVID-19 and if from a demographic group that we've tried to target. And so one of the most recent demographic groups we've targeted that we can target down to the county level um, were black young folks age 18 to 35. And so we had um, in the South and uh, particularly in rural counties in the South. And we did a lot of door-to-door um, -door outreach in those areas as well, where we would leave door hangers, like these little paper 
pamphlets kind of that you can put around a doorknob so that if folks didn't have the internet, you could just read it, but then it would also list our website. And so many of our views are driven by these paid placements. Um, we also get, we have a partnership with YouTube and Google to share information with us about what people are looking for so that we know how to shape what um, our upcoming videos are about. And the number one questions folks have for the five to 11 year olds right now um, are, about long-term side effects and about fertility. And so we're gonna have a lot more videos coming out over the next two weeks about um, pregnancy because pregnant women have some of the lowest rates of COVID vaccination, the demographic group or birthing people generally. And then, um, and then fertility and this question around side effects. Thank you. And as I predicted, the questions are now rolling in so quickly that I'm not sure that we get through all of them, but uh, we're going to try. Um, there is uh, someone at Kaiser who says, I can't remember which graph it is, but does the data you presented take into account immigrant status when discussing PTO? That's a great question. I don't know how the US, that data was from the Department of Labor Statistics. I don't know if they if they account for immigration status, like if you're undocumented, I wouldn't be surprised if you're not included in that data set. And if their rates of lacking paid time off are some of the highest rates, because your employer wouldn't, if you're employed and paid by somebody, they don't acknowledge you to the Bureau of Labor. Uh, so they don't pay taxes uh, often for you. So I would say they're probably excluded from that population, but I don't know 100%. And then uh, Dr. Lee Atkinson McAvoy asks, are there examples of how health systems like ours can partner to improve access by local infrastructures to improve access? Yes, so right now um, we've been doing a lot of behind the scene work with uh, some of the federal agencies working on the five to 11 rollout. And one of our kind of recommendations that we're working with them through or how to partner health systems with the pharmacies that are gonna give out the vaccines to five to 11 year olds and with schools who are gonna give out the vaccines. So if you have pre-existing partnerships with any of those groups, now is the time to make sure that they're incredibly robust. So particularly for pharmacies, one of the concerns with all of the outpatient care pharmacies give is that there isn't a good feedback loop for providers to understand what care did you receive and what follow-up do you need? And for the vaccines, we would worry that if people had side effects and they receive their vaccine at a pharmacy, that we wouldn't have, our data systems wouldn't connect, that there wouldn't be any report of when you got your vaccine or which vaccine you got or what the lot number was, et cetera. And so we're trying to create all of those pathways. The school similarly, because the safety data around or the the safety protocols around delivering that one third of a dose to the five to 11 year olds calls for a higher level of attention when they're giving the doses out at schools. Uh, we also want them to do it in partnership with uh, a health system. And so if you guys have partnerships with schools, I think it's a great way to make sure you're supporting them as they do a little bit of a more complicated vaccine distribution for a five to 11. Um, and then Dr. April Adro asks, uh, thank you for showing the data of progress in the Black community in particular, and thinking about the myriad interventions you have been involved in to address the inequitable gap. What approaches, strategies do you think have thus far been most e effective? Thanks for this question. Honestly, I give all credit to Black folks. I think in general in this country, I think Black folks are still doing are still out here surviving and thriving because of the work we do as collectives and as communities to make sure people are covered. And so much of what we saw as we went across the country were black led organizations, independent, just black neighbors saying when they called in, I talked to my neighbor or I brought so-and-so with me to this event about vaccines. Like people just started taking care of each other. And I think, you know, black professionals like me did the same thing. What are we doing for communities? I think we saw something similar in Latinx communities where there was this very collective approach to how we were going to get everyone covered and how we were going to share this information and get folks to vaccination sites. And I feel like that's, that's really what's done it. It's um, a pattern we've seen in black communities from all of the social movements black folks have done. When we need it, we lift each other up and get there. And I think regular folks and professional folks and all of us really did it together. Thank you. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. It's one o'clock, but maybe I can squeeze in one more question, um, which I'm sure um, is not an easy one to answer, but um, 
uh, might resonate with people. Dr. Javé Ross says, thank you so much for this. As a black pediatrician, I've made it one of my own personal duties to take time to have an op open conversation with each of my vaccine hesitant families about this issue. But it can be exhausting. I won't give up, but I wonder what tools you may be able to reference to make some of these conversations less taxing on the provider, but still enriching for the patients and families. Excellent question, Jere. Hey, um, I think a couple of things. One, there are some structural changes that have to happen that we've also advocated for. So every time you counsel a family about vaccines, if they don't choose to get that vaccine right then or you don't have it, you can't be reimbursed for it. And so we're trying to actually get reimbursement for all the counseling pediatricians are doing about the vaccines so that you know, you can actually have a full visit just about vaccine counseling. So it's not tacked onto the end of a visit that was about, you know, a myriad of other things. Um, I also think tools like ours, we hope are useful. So if families have a specific question, you could literally just point them to the video. And on our website, you can just search by content area and say, oh, you have a question about fertility. Here's a 30 second video by, you know, an OBGYN, many of whom honestly <laughs> are from the Bay Area. Um, that can explain your question. So pointing people to other resources, I think is really useful or to upcoming webinars um, is really useful. And then honestly, noting our own capacity. I just said all the things that I feel like black folks have been doing and it's been a lot and we're tired and we need a break. And I think noting your own capacity and when you're tapped out, it's okay to tap out. And to our other colleagues, it's important for you to tap in. If some of us need a break because we've been doing this you know, 18 months on stop at this point, like we all need to share this load to make sure communities of color are well um, informed about this critical choice they're making. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's a number of comments uh, in the Q&A uh, from, from big fans all saying, thank you so much. This is really fantastic and you're an inspiration. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for we just have to have you keep on coming back. Maybe at some point we are back in person again and we can actually um, make sure that we get you over here in person. But really appreciate you taking the time uh, and for this fantastic uh, talk um, and uh, wishing everybody a very good rest of their afternoon. Thanks, everybody.